welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In the last video, I discussed what I deemed to be what I called the confusion going on in Star Trek Discovery's understanding of Star Trek philosophy. As expected, I received a goodly share of both support and criticism of my position, and this is exactly what I hoped, as it was my express purpose to spark a discussion on a few angles relating to this new TV series that may not have been considered by Star Trek fandom at large, given the revelations mentioned in the video. I'd like to continue with that line of thought, expanding it further to include additional information coming out of the recent San Diego Comic Con and other sources. That being said, we will continue on with what I consider to be the ongoing confusion over Star Trek Discovery's understanding of Star Trek philosophy. While alive, Gene Roddenberry had a long-standing rule of having little to no tension between principal characters, but instead focusing all serious conflict on the guest or supporting characters. This rule was long considered a hindrance by writers during the Next Generation era, including such personas as Michael Piller, who called it Roddenberry's box, and from what is known, the DS9 years sought to slightly alter this rule to allow for at least some conflict between characters. The creators of Star Trek Discovery have also boldly announced their intention to break faith with this rule, telling us that Star Trek Discovery will in fact feature conflict between the major characters, though so far the types and ways in which these conflicts will emerge remains unknown. Now we know that there was conflict between the principles of the former Star Trek series. This was especially evident during the original series between Mr. Spock and Dr. McCoy, and to some degree between the good Captain Kirk losing his very short temper with Dr. McCoy also. Now, by way of comparison, the relationships between the Next Generation crew were almost angelic and hardly ever reached a point near simmering. The DS9 crews did spar with one another from, t from time to time, but this was also very, uh, very well managed within the relationships of the various individuals and very rarely did it go beyond anything that lasted for too long. The crew of Voyager suffered few long-term consequences of the various disagreements between them also. Now sure, there were instances with each of these crews where they had a conflagration, but these were minor and generally barely lasted the episode, never mind the season, and certainly not for the entire series. So all in all, the Roddenberry rule, as I call it, held steadfast. But there is another angle here, because the writers of Star Trek Discovery have said that they are going further than just breaking faith with the Roddenberry rule, citing the notion of Game of Thrones style death. Discovery's helmsmen appear to be trying to fit it into the more modern trope of dystopic science fiction that is sweeping the airways today. Now we don't watch Star Trek for a dismal view of the future, and we're certainly not watching it to see the Machiavellian style power plays and deaths which are a hallmark of the Game of Thrones series. And if you like Game of Thrones, by the way, I'm certainly not trying to mock your choice in entertainment, but Star Trek is not Game of Thrones. It has, at its core, a fundamentally different philosophy and worldview, and the question we should probably ask in light of the New Discovery's handler's statement is, should we be trying to mix the two? Now this is not to say that Star Trek cannot or should not explore dark themes. It can, and it has. In fact, in my opinion, some of the finest hours of Star Trek TV history have been during the run of Deep Space Nine, when our heroes of that series were forced to make some very hard choices and endure very harsh life circumstances. Episodes like Rocks and Shoals, In the Pale Moonlight, The Siege of AR-558, Tears of the Prophets, and Inter Arma Inum Sealant Legas come to my mind almost immediately as episodes of weighty and complex ethical and moral consequence. Now, yes, I know all of the episodes I mentioned were during the Dominion War arc, but there are many more, and I'm sure that even as I speak, you are thinking of some of your own favorite episodes that fell into this category. But though Deep Space Nine was a series with some often very mature themes, there were very few times, at least in my recollection, when it traversed beyond Star Trek's core idealism, and when it did, DS9 always struggled with the moral and ethical dilemmas that were placed in the context of the episode. It was not a Machiavellian decision rooted only in some kind of Friedrich Nietzsche will to power scenario or some pragmatic Kennedy School cost-benefit analysis. So, the connection to Star Trek Discovery is this. 
if we are going to see this kind of, uh, how, how, how should we say it, this kind of dark territory explored in this new series, then it should be observed within the classical Star Trek philosophy of people overcoming, not embracing, their base animal instincts and impulses. It should be observed within the context of the upward reach of human beings, which is characteristic of Star Trek idealism. Again, Star Trek is not Game of Thrones. It is not the rebooted Battlestar Galactica of last decade, and never may the kind of cynical calculus that is fundamental to those shows become part of Star Trek as a matter of normality. Star Trek is about human beings aspiring to be their best both individually and as a species, and we need to make sure that it stays that way. And if Star Trek Discovery intends to challenge that idealism, then at the end of the day, we need to see indications that this form of idealism, which is at the heart of Star Trek's being, is going to be in ascendance. With this subject, I am going to address what is probably the most controversial matter surrounding Star Trek Discovery to date, and I'm probably going to draw fire from those of you on both sides of the issue. Well, so be it. Much noise has been made over Sonequa Martin-Green and Michelle Yeoh for their upcoming roles in Star Trek Discovery. The revelation that Star Trek Discovery would feature two female leads and a diverse cast provoked both interest and ire, each for different reasons. Many supported the idea, while others vociferously despised it as further evidence that a kind of white exclusion principle was subtly being advocated for by the series. They claimed that the presence of two female leads of color and only one white male lead was evidence that an ongoing agenda to denigrate Caucasian people specifically and Western civilization generally continues to be the new countercultural paradigm of modern popular entertainment. Now, let us not be mistaken. There does exist those whom see Miss Martin Green and Miss Yo as representing a threat to perhaps not only their own personal dominance of the world, but the dominance of their particular group. So this is not in any way to deny that there are those out there, even within the Star Trek community, who may harbor concealed thoughts of racial or ethnic superiority not in tune with Star Trek's core idealism. Not either is it to limit such feelings, however irrational they may be, to humans of a single extraction alone. Indeed, history proves unequivocally that all humans are capable of such prejudices and to the extent that they can exert those prejudices to abuse the rights of others, history also demonstrates this too will often sadly be the case. Now, it is not my purpose to argue for or against the presence of bigoted Trekkies within our ranks. I mention them because their presence was used as a platform from which Star Trek Discovery's representatives launched an appeal for understanding and inclusion in keeping with Star Trek's basic philosophy, and that save from perhaps a quite vocal minority, is not in question, and never has been. However, this criticism from a very small tribe within Star Trek fandom was seized upon by the media as evidence that there still exists within the Trek community, and by more broad implication the United States, an overwhelming coterie of upset racists and misogynists who are simply incapable of accepting that the world is comprised of more than one type of people, and further, that in the future, that world will not be dominated by one type of people alone. But is this media-created paradigm one that asserts there is hatred and intolerance around every corner? Is this the truth? Is this so-called phalanx of regressives truly illustrative of some broad bastion of either the Star Trek or U.S. population? Do two women of color in charge of a very diversified crew represent a march toward the enlightened United Earth that has always been a staple of Star Trek from 1966 to the present just because they are women of color. Star Trek has always been appropriately cosmopolitan in its representation of the Parliament of Man, but such a parliament was built upon a foundation of ideas that, as depicted across all five of its incarnations, had come to be universally accepted by common humanity within the Star Trek universe. In a modern world that doesn't entirely share its peculiar set of values, it must be recognized that Star Trek has drawn much of its core identity from precepts firmly structured in Western civilization. While it has always preached a doctrine of global brotherhood, Star Trek's fundamental principles of liberty and responsibility, freedom of conscience, 
the rule of law, democratic society, the inherent value of each individual, and personal merit are largely constructions of Western classical liberalism. If Star Trek Discovery tries to substitute these values with the modern form of virtue signaling that emphasizes sameness over uniqueness, social egalitarianism above individual quality, and ideological collectivism as opposed to harmony despite differences of belief and opinion, can it continue to represent the kind of liberalism which previous iterations of Star Trek always sought to pursue? I think the answer is obvious. It's difficult for a house to stand, after all, when one has knocked out the foundations. This was not a form of liberalism that masqueraded as counterfeit social progress, not one that sought to control action, attitude, and the right to even hold an idea that ran against some undefinable virtue-signaling zeitgeist, but one which pursued excellence and freedom, both for the individual and the collective, and one that sought to use the art of reason and persuasion to convince the intolerant and the prejudiced to grow beyond their fears. By now it is no secret to most that Star Trek Discovery has been rife with developmental difficulties, but it is the nature and scope of these difficulties that has eluded public scrutiny until just not too long ago. Although information has been seeping out since late last year, much of what we've learned about Star Trek Discovery came this year, in 2017. And it is these revelations that have sparked the fury of criticism and revulsion which Trek fans have rightly unleashed against this new series. Now when I first started looking at the developmental problems surrounding Star Trek Discovery, like many of you I was focused on the aesthetics, the uniforms, the technology, the exaggerated sophistication of the starships, and of course one could not escape those so named Klingons who threatened to strike you blind in one eye if you gave them more than a cursory glance. They may have been fine for a new enemy race if Star Trek Discovery so chose to make them that but they were not fine for the more or less established canon we've observed since 1979. But, as I went further, I began to learn that these changes, or at least some of them, were not the end product of a creative new direction simply wanting to separate itself from the old school, as it were, but instead were the result of a war going on behind the scenes between then-executive producer Brian Fuller and CBS bigwig Leslie Les Moonves. You see, when we were first informed about the new direction Discovery was going in, many of us, frankly, balked at what we saw, and subsequently sought to rebel against the new direction and take the fight back to CBS in protest. We articulated our sneaking suspicion that Discovery, though it was being called a prime iteration Star Trek series, that is, one which would take place in the original timeline of Star Trek that proceeded from the 1966 series, it was, in fact, not a prime line series at all. Instead, many suggested it was a Kelvin timeline reboot of the series, that is, that abomination known as the J.J. Abrams version of Star Trek. Indeed, some even dared state plainly that CBS was flat-out lying to the Star Trek community in an effort to pull the wool over our proverbial eyes and funnel subscribers into its all-access network using Discovery as the worm that would bait the proverbial hook. Others dared opine that the new Star Trek fan film rules, which came into being after the Star Trek Axanar debacle, were also directly related to this new series and that the struggle to crush Axanar for its insolence was not just connected to its breaking of a gentleman's agreement between the big studio and independent Star Trek fan films never to profit from fan-made movies, but was, in fact, covertly designed to protect CBS's corporate and monetary interests and investment in the upcoming Discovery series. Now, I do not claim that this assertion is provable, and for the time being, it is just that, an assertion. But is it possible, is it possible that it could also be informed speculation given the similarities in storyline and timeline between Axanar and Star Trek Discovery? As they are jealous to say on the Fox News Network, we report, you decide. 
But let's go further. Because the mysterious departure of former executive producer Brian Fuller at some of the most critical junctures of Discovery's development also shook up not only the series, but when it was learned that he had left, the fan community as well. For, as we came to quickly find out, Brian Fuller was the living, breathing heart of Star Trek Discovery, the man around whose almost singular vision the series was being shaped. Trek fandom was shocked. What had happened? We were informed that Brian Fuller had departed over scheduling conflicts between his stars produced American Gods TV series and Star Trek Discovery. And like many other myths constructed around this series to give its delays more credibility, this narrative persisted for months without the slightest change. But it was finally revealed to be untrue, or at least only half true. Brian Fuller, it turns out, far from leaving under his own power, was in fact fired and dismissed from his position by none other than Les Moonves over alleged creative differences. Oh, I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. Bamboozled. Let us stray. Run them up. This is what he does. But in fairness, we cannot assign total fault to Leslie Moonves for this blundered, mismanaged, and foobar series. For the record shows that Brian Fuller himself also took a big hand in much of the reimagining that is Star Trek Discovery. From the redesigned Klingons, whom no one recognized as such without being told beforehand that they were, to purposely giving Mr. Spock an adopted sister who was not once ever mentioned in the entire 50 years of Star Trek history, it was Mr. Fuller who greenlit these changes as a way to sex up the series and make it more digestible to the modern era. Now I am not going to get into the imbroglio over Michael Burnham in terms of why Spock never mentioned her before. Everyone was stunned when in Star Trek V, Cybok appeared out of nowhere, and even going back to the original series, nobody on board the Enterprise knew that Spock had a wife named Tipring until he was forced to return to Vulcan to endure Ponfar. Nor did they even know that Sarek and Amanda Grayson were Spock's parents until they came aboard the Enterprise in Journey to Babel. So yes, it is entirely possible for Spock to have a human adopted sister no one's bloody heard of before. So the issue isn't that. The issue is that this move appears to give further suggestion to the idea that this entire program is based upon a casual and not too well considered revision of Star Trek history. One that demonstrates it is neither within the prime timeline, but not necessarily outside of it either. This move, like the radical redesign of the Klingons itself, appears to show an almost casual disregard for established continuity which Star Trek Discovery's creators will use as a vehicle to take the show in whatever direction they choose without any concern for the vitriolic criticism that is occurring within the Star Trek fan community. Folks, believe me when I tell you, they did not expect to get this kind of energetic and unrelenting assault, this full fury of backlash and wrath that has sprung up as a result of these sweeping changes that will take place within the Discovery timeline. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. And as I pointed out in a previous video, you are being told that you will simply accept this new doctrine, or you will get out of the way and make room for those who will. Now, unless Mr. Fuller is being thrown under the bus by the higher-ups at CBS in an effort at damage control, the evidence suggests that he is, or was, deeply embedded in charting this new course for Star Trek Discovery, and that he played a complicit role in this new doctrine. Just how deeply remains unknown. So I am not going to rag on Brian Fuller until more information comes out. I have asked myself, is there any place we as fans should exercise restraint and compassion in this situation? The answer is yes. If there is anywhere we should stay the sword of retribution that has been unsheathed by Star Trek Discovery, it is toward the actors and crew and all those who behind the scenes make a television program possible. People, these actors and others are not stupid. They have their Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts. They can see how incensed you are. And they know what a legendary 
cultural icon they are becoming a part of by hitching their names to the Star Trek bandwagon, by agreeing to come on board this gig, a gig which, as thespians, will put quite a feather in their cap over time. They are bystanders caught up in a furor, caught between the crossfire that is being exchanged between you and the fat cats at CBS. And they should understand that we have no beef with them, and that Trekkies are very compassionate toward the actors and all the supporting people who toil to create for us a universe we care for so much. And we will indeed show our love for these people at any opportunity that is given to us. They should understand that, and they should understand that we are also very forgiving of mistakes made by those same people. But we will be absolutely without mercy toward those who try to hold us in contempt and treat us as if we are little bambinos who cannot tell up from down and truth from lies when we see them. And that is exactly where this reckoning is leading. It is not against the actors and crew of Star Trek Discovery that we have turned our ire, but upon those offenders in high places who would try to play us for stupid while they reach ere long into our pocketbooks to deprive us not only of our money, but the legacy of a program that has done so much to inspire the world. The shot callers at CBS have laid down a gauntlet which they believe you do not have the fortitude to answer. They believe that no matter what they do to sully the universe that you love, you will respond by bending the knee in supplication in exchange for a mere taste of some new incarnation of Star Trek, no matter how poisoned that taste may be. The corporate interests now in control of this franchise have told you that they intend to change forever the bedrock foundations upon which this story was built, to alter it in such a fashion that one day you may not be able to speak the name of Star Trek without shame and humiliation for what it has become. My friends, the powers that be challenge you to stand up before them. What is your response?